Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. I am of course Mark with Midwest Astro and today I'm going to try to answer a question that I am asked somewhat frequently. How do you decide what you want to image? So here we are in Stellarium. I use Stellarium and Nina interchangeably to get these items. So to start out, the first thing you want to do when you open Stellarium is press F11. That way you can go to a windowed screen. Then we're going to press F5 and then F4. F5, F4. We're going to come over here to DSO. We're going to say SH2. We're going to pick PGC, UGC, and ARP. Now, the reason why I'm selecting these is because here in the Northern Hemisphere in the month of April, it is galaxy season. That means we don't really have many nebulas that we can actually image. Maybe reflection and dark nebulae, but we definitely don't have any emission nebulae, or at least we don't have it until the wee early morning hours. So with that, we're going to go galaxy hunting in this case. We're going to set those up. We're going to turn on labels and markers. And we're going to bump those up pretty high. Then we're going to come over here to surveys. Make sure you pick deep sky and then scroll down to DSS. If I can, there it is. DSS colored. Once you put a check in the box on your keyboard, you need to press and hold control alt D as in dog, and that will download that. The way you know if it did or not is this is gonna be your typical Stellarium view right here. If you go control alt D, there you go. We can see Orion's in the daytime. So we need to bump this up to where we know it's gonna be dark. Once we pick a time that it's dark, we can go ahead and pause our time by just coming down to this bottom bar, hovering and pressing the current play button. Now, we have one big problem. The moon exists at all and it's almost completely illuminated. So with that, we can't really image anything over here to the east because we're gonna be flooded with moonlight, especially with broadband and it, it stinks. But it is what it is, we can't change it. So let's come over here and look for something in the northeast sky that will help eliminate a lot of that stray moonlight from coming into our telescope. Now let's just pick maybe this uh, the splinter galaxy to start with. I'm going to come up here and if I hover it tells me it's the image sensor frame. I'm going to click that. So the first thing you see here is a large rectangular box that coincides with the size of my APS-C size sensor. Then you see this square. And this square is my off-axis guider. This circle and this circle make a donut, which just tells me the height and the bottom of my OAG in the event I rotate it. That way I can plan for stars. Like if these stars aren't bright enough to truly guide with, I can rotate it maybe 30 degrees to the right, and then I can use these as my guide stars which might line up because after you do meridian flip, you're gonna be closer to these stars over here, and these seem like they're bright enough. So with that, let's say we want to image this splinter galaxy, right? It looks like it could be promising. It's got some decent details in it. Nothing, nothing that's like truly awe-inspiring, but it could be a really good image. Once we've picked our target, we just make sure that this box is ever so slightly expanding and contracting, and that splinter galaxy, or the target we desire, is right up here. Then inside of Nina, we go to the framing tab and then right here, I'm gonna click the get coordinates from planetarium. Now, if you're not familiar with a lot of these steps, I have already made videos over these. I would definitely encourage you to go to my very first videos that I've made where I show you how to do a lot of this. There's also a video on how to connect Stellarium to Nina and such. So with that, we have our framing. We can zoom in, we can move it around if we want. Maybe we don't want that really bright star in there. So maybe we offset it just a little bit here. And then once we're happy, we can say add target to sequence. Now, how do I know if I'm happy? Well, I wanna to try to image a target all night. How do I know if it's up there all night? Same thing, I have a video on how to create the artificial horizon, which is what you see here. You can see here is where we're going from daylight to astronomical dark. So we do have astronomical dusk as well as nautical dusk. We can see the red line is gonna track all the way up to 73 degrees. Now my personal recommendation is always trying to find a target that is gonna be above the 30 degree marker. Anything under 30 degrees just, 
you got a lot of atmosphere to look through and it's not going to be what I believe you're going to be looking for. So with that, go ahead and try to find something that's going to be high up in the sky. We can see here once it's really dark, we're right at the 30 degrees, give or take a little bit, maybe one or two degrees off right at the very beginning, but that's okay. And we can image this all night because we can see dawn starts to approach and we're still in the 60 range even when it becomes too light to still image. So with that, we will go ahead and stick with this. Now, I have made a video on how to do advanced sequencing. This is where that particular video comes into effect. If we click add to sequence, we go to sequencer. I know I'm gonna use my RC8 in this particular case, but you can see I have multiple sets of information here. So this stands for RC8, it's step two, and I'll show you the difference between step one and step three in conjunction with step two. And then I have broadband, narrowband broadband, and then narrowband by itself. So this would be applicable, of course, if I'm gonna do like RGB stars inside of an emission nebula. But in this particular case, we know we're only doing LRGB. So let's do broadband. The first thing I do when this opens is I go ahead and minimize it. And we'll take a look here in a second. Now I'm going to go up to templates because I've created all of my templates. I know RC is gonna be the last set of templates which if you look here, I've opened my file location. This PC documents Nina templates. I've created these folder names. That is what you see over here where it says user template RC8, RC8. This is that folder. And if I click that, you'll see these templates here. And that's what coincides down here. All I've done is copy these templates and then I've modified them in a manner that coincides with my particular telescope. So if I'm at with an F4, I might shoot a shorter exposure time and at F8 with the RC8, I might shoot a little bit of a longer exposure. So with that, the first thing I'm gonna do here is RC8 step one, right? This is my first step. So I'm gonna put it right here. Step two, you don't see it anymore because the Splinter Galaxy changes out the name, but this is what we're looking at, right? Step two is deciding what kind of target I have. This is my own personal naming convention for simplicity. You can use it or you can do whatever you would personally like. You can name these whatever makes sense to you. Then for me, step three is the ending sequence. And then because I use a flat panel, I'm gonna go up here to my flats folder and I'm gonna pick the universal broadband flats and I'm gonna drag that over. And then I'm going to come up here to my base set and I'm gonna pick Pushover complete. So let's quickly run through what it is we just set up. So in step one, you see this pushover app notification here. I highly encourage anybody that's using Nina to pay the $5 for the pushover app. This will literally text me and tell me if something failed. It's a savior of many nights worth of potentially ruined data already for me. If focus fails, if it doesn't plate solve, or maybe the Meridian flip doesn't work out well. It will notify me and I don't just wake up to bad data. It notifies me on the spot and I can immediately intervene in correct. The next thing I have here is wait for time. I'm gonna wait until nautical dusk because while it's not dark enough to truly image, it is dark enough to get the party started. What I mean by that is we're gonna start cooling the camera and other functions. So at this time of nautical dusk, minus 15 minutes, you can see here, if I remove this, it will then, uh, let me put zero. It won't start until 8.43 PM. Now you may be wondering, how did I come up with these times? As you see, it automatically updates based off of your geographic location. So at 8.28 PM, my telescope will open the flat cover panel. Now you see these red exclamation marks here or the red circle with a white exclamation mark. That just means that that device is not connected yet. I am using my main desktop computer and not my imaging computer. So therefore I'll never actually connect to this particular PC. I always remote into the other PC, which these will go away as soon as I connect my flat cover panel. So at this time, we'll open this and then in parallel sequence. So in no particular order, we will unpark the scope, cool the camera to minus 20 degrees. Now in this case, in the dead of winter, I use minus 20. In the fall and spring, I use minus 10. And in the dead of summer, I use 
zero because that's usually about what the camera can safely acquire at under 80% cooler power. We will then turn on the dew heater just in case here in the Midwest we do get a lot of humidity so it is best to just go ahead and kick that on and make sure nothing fogs up with a really cool sensor touching potentially humid glass. So with that, once these have started, we will then also pick up this plan because this set here encompasses this set. It doesn't matter what the order is. They will all start at the same time. So these will all start and then we will do the focus and find routine, which I've set up. I have found with my Ioptron, there were times where it didn't know where it was starting. It thought it was in a different position than looking at Polaris. So with that, I go ahead and run this solve and sync. That way it knows exactly where it's starting before I start telling it to go find a galaxy or find a nebula. But what it'll do first is if you look here, this order set is sequential. This is in parallel. This means that once we start this, all of these will fire, but this one will fire in conjunction with these. However, this has a sequential set, meaning one item to complete after the other has completed. So the first thing that means is we're gonna switch our filter. We're gonna change over to the luminance. Why? Because it's way easier to plate solve and find things with a shorter exposure with the luminance filter with a monochrome camera. After we do that, we'll just double check that we're in focus. Yes, this is important. I've had multiple times where I wasn't properly in focus, kicked it off and it couldn't plate solve. So it is important to run autofocus and then the solve and sync. If you are not tracking something though, this will throw an error, which is totally fine because you're not actually tracking it. You just want it to know you're pointed at Polaris. If I tell you to go to M51, you only have to go this far as opposed to if you think you're pointing way over to the West, then you have to track in meridian flip right so I, i've had some weird things happen and this is just a i want to make sure it doesn't happen again measure once all of these things have completed because the whole set is a sequential set then <clears throat> this is another template that i have created it is custom and you save it as blank that way when you send it send a target over to the particular plan the target just automatically populates this information for you. And then all of these things are already set for me. So again, triggers, I don't like the word trigger. I like the word checks. We're gonna check, have we passed the Meridian flip? Well, if we haven't even started, we probably haven't passed the Meridian flip. It is possible, I guess, um, but probably not plausible. The next thing we're gonna check is, have we centered a drift? Well, if we haven't taken an image, it doesn't matter. Then we're going to check, do we need to restore guiding? Well, if we haven't started guiding, that won't matter. Um, autofocus after HFR increase, same thing, right? And then if anything fails, it's going to text me. Then our loop until time. I told you before, I wanted to pick a target that I could image all night. Therefore, again, based off my geographical location here with longitude and latitude, it knows that at 5.55 in the morning, nautical dawn will hit. I likely can't image anymore. So it will then stop my sequential instruction set down below and it'll move on. But if we're just starting out, this won't apply just yet. The first thing it's going to do is slew and center. We're going to start guiding and we're going to start kicking off these images. Now, if you don't recall, after every single exposure, really, really quickly, I mean, we're talking fractions of a second. This will jump back up to the triggers and it will check each one of these. If they all pass, it'll take the next exposure. If one of these fails, it will then restore the guiding or it will run an autofocus if it's a greater than 10% increase or if you change the filters subsequently after one image. It will check these things. If they all pass, it'll move on to the next exposure, assuming you haven't hit this time. So I have this set up the same way every single time. I don't even have to touch this unless I just want to touch my quantities. We're not going to do that here. So we're going to go ahead and move on. We're going to assume that we're at 555 in the morning. We're done imaging. So the next thing it's going to do is run the ending sequence, which is in parallel. I'm going to part the scope and close the flat panel cover. It doesn't matter what order because it's a parallel set. Once both of these have it completed, we will then jump down to the sequential order set of broadband flats. Now, when you have 
a flat panel like I do that can open and close and become your light board for your flats. It, this particular one has 255 levels of brightness. What I do ahead of time is while the telescope's in the house in a dark location, I then come over here to the flat wizard and I will go to multi-mode and I will run all of these with the particular settings. And these are the standard settings. I haven't changed these. It will run this. I actually change it to dynamic brightness since the board can change its own brightness. You know, and you just dial in these settings until you get a good ADU or, you know, histogram mean target. And then what it'll do is it'll record what level of brightness, how long of an exposure you needed to attain enough data from your training. We're going to call this the training. You run through this, tweak everything once, and then it saves. So once you've done this, it'll pull from the diagram. You come over here to your flats, and then you just change what your gain is that coincides with what gain you chose when you set up your flats. Um, that'll all be taken care of once you have a, cam a camera connected, and that way you can define what gain you're using with the camera. Um, so in this case, I usually use 100, especially for narrow band. Um, with something like an F4, I probably will go to zero. With the F8, I might leave it here at 100. Um, leaving it at a higher gain just allows me to take a shorter exposure. Um, so once this is all done, it'll automatically do it with the light board. I don't have to do anything. It will then, once completed, it'll turn off the dew heater and it'll begin to warm the camera. And then once these are done, because we're in a sequential set, it will then text me and just tell me everything's complete. So with that, um, let me know questions that you guys have below, but this is how I go about picking a target that I want to image. Um, if you don't have any questions, let me know what targets you guys are gonna be shooting soon. With that, thank you so much for joining Clear Skies, and we'll talk to you guys next time.